You know, just a few weeks ago, I was invited to a private conversation in Springfield. It was on a Sunday night, and there were about 25 of us invited. I did not know anyone else in this meeting. I was invited to be a part of a conversation. And, and it was basically to say, let's have some civil conversations that might lead to some common sense solutions for some of the problems our community faces. And there was a wide diversity of people, politically, um, racially, religiously, uh, in, in all kinds of ways. There was a diversity among the people in that closed restaurant that night as we sat there and we talked. And as I came in, um, I was being introduced to the people who were already there. And they introduced me to one person who had uh, been in prison for about 18 years and is now out and doing really well. And they said, we want you to meet Ricky Powell. He's the pastor of Fort Caroline Baptist Church. And immediately this man said, I know your church. And I said, you do? How do you know our church? Do you live in our area? He said, no, I, I don't live in your area. But I've heard about your church and how you work in the community. He said, it doesn't surprise me that you're here. And I said, well, what have you heard? He said, well, I've heard you guys feed people in your neighborhood. And I said, yes, we do, actually. And so we talked a little bit about that. And I, told, I left that meeting that night thinking, here's a person who's never stepped foot in our church, who doesn't know much about our church, didn't know me, doesn't know anything else that we do, but he had heard about the good work that you are doing in this community to help people in practical ways. He had heard about our boxes of blessing where we fed over 500 families last Thanksgiving. And he said, I heard about your church. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Praise God. And I thought to myself, I would rather our church be known for what we do in this community than what we do in this building. People, people may not know how we sing or how I preach, but I want them to know how we love. How we love each other and how we love our community. And that's a part of what we're going to talk about today in this Be Rich campaign. Today I want to talk to you about a message that I'm going to call Better Done Than Said. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in the New Testament. I'm going to put the words on the screen as well. But it's in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. And here we're going to hear the Apostle John, one of those first followers of Jesus, someone who knew Jesus well, who watched him as he performed his miracles and heard him as he preached and saw him as he was betrayed by Judas and condemned by the Jews and the Romans. He was there whenever they crucified Jesus, and he thought all hope was lost, but then John's life was radically redirected when the resurrected Jesus physically appeared to John and the other disciples and for the rest of John's life, until he died as an old man, banished by the Roman Empire on an island of Patmos, he lived the rest of his life talking about the love of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ, his Lord and his Savior. And John was overwhelmed with how much Jesus had loved him and how Jesus had sacrificially loved the world by giving his own life for the sins of the world. And John made it his passion to focus his life and his writing and his preaching and teaching on the love of Jesus. Not only so that we could experience the love of Jesus, but so that we could express the love of Jesus to other people. And John is the, the apostle of love. He loved Jesus, he was loved by Jesus, and he wants us to understand something about love. And he wants us to understand that love is better done than said. 
It's easy to say, I love you. In fact, I usually tell couples when I'm performing their wedding ceremony, some of you know this, I, I tell couples during their ceremony after they have said their I do's and I love you's, I'll tell them, now, this ceremony is the easiest thing you'll ever do when it comes to marriage. This is the easy part. Saying I love you is easy. Showing it in the ups and the downs and the every days of life is where it can be difficult. Love, however, is better done than said. People need to hear that we love them, but they also, more importantly, need to see that we love them in practical, tangible ways. And so John is writing about this kind of love in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We're jumping in the middle of his thought here, but he, he makes this statement. This is how we know what love is. He said, it's possible to know what love is. And this is how we who are followers of Jesus absolutely, confidently, assuredly know what love is. Here it is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. This is how we know what love is. You want to see the supreme example of love go to the cross of Calvary and see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hanging there, dying there, suffering there, and you will see the supreme example of love. This is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love looks like. This is how we know how love behaves. Look at Jesus Christ on the cross. And what is he doing on that cross? He's laying down his life. He's giving away his greatest possession, his life, for our greatest problem, our sins. He is dying there, not for himself. He's dying there for us. And listen, that's an important phrase, for us. It is a reminder that when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he was not merely dying as an example of love. That's what many philosophers today want to do with the cross of Calvary. They want to reduce it to nothing more than another example of love. Here's an example of love. Here's an example of love. Oh yeah, and Jesus on the cross, that's another example of love. While the cross of Calvary is an example of love, there's far more going on here than just to give you an example of love. Some people say, well, Jesus just dying on the cross is just another martyr dying for what he believed. And he certainly did die for what he believed. But there's something going on here far deeper than just an example of love or someone dying for what he believed. The New Testament clearly teaches that when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying as your substitute. He was dying for you. He was dying on your behalf. He was dying to pay the price for your sin and for mine. That's what love does. Love lays down its own life for the benefit of someone else's life. Love is not self-centered. It's others-centered. Love is not selfish, it is sacrificial. And Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for you. Should have been you, should have been me dying for our own sin, our own wrong. But out of love, Jesus was dying for you. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And here's the radical obligation that is placed on all of us who have received this kind of love. John writes, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He says, in light of the love of Jesus giving himself for us on the cross, we ought to also sacrificially love other people, our brothers and sisters. Now, whenever you think about it, who are these brothers and sisters John is referring to? Well, if you read his writings, you know most naturally it, it is other believers in Jesus. We are a part of the family of God through our common faith in Jesus Christ. But this is the same John who told us in John 3.16, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, the love of God doesn't just go to people who believe in Jesus. The love of God is available to all people. God loved the world so much. In this way, God loved the world. He gave his son for Jesus. And Jesus died for you. Whether you believe in him or not, he loved you and freely offered his life for you. And so as followers of Jesus, yes, we ought to love each other who believe like we believe. But the love of God extends to all people, whether they believe like we believe or not, whether they look like we do or not, whether they're of the same race or ethnicity or religion or nation. We should love indiscriminately like Jesus loves the world. And he says, so here's how we know what love is. We see Jesus on the cross, and we realized he was dying for us. That's love. He didn't just declare he loved us. He demonstrated he loved us when he died on the cross of Calvary. My daughter Casey is now an adult, but when she was a little girl, I would often tuck her in at night, and we would... We would play this little game, I love you. And she would then say, I love you more. I said, well, I love you more, and I love you more. And we just had a fun little time like a dad and a little girl will. And, and then from the I love you, I love you more, I love you more, it turned into, well, I love you this much. And she's, well, I love you this much. Well, I love you this much. Well, I love you this much. And we would end until we had our arms stretched as wide as we could. Well, I love you this much. And then I would hug her and kiss her and Tell her good night. And listen, when Jesus Christ wanted to demonstrate his love for you, he stretched out his arms and he allowed himself to be nailed to a wooden cross. And he said, do you want to know how much I love you? In spite of all the bad you've done, in spite of all the sin, in spite of all those days you regret, all those decisions you wish you could do over again. Do you know how much I love you? Even though you don't always love me and you don't always love each other, I love you this much. I love you enough to die for you. And we who are followers of Jesus know this. It's what changed our lives. It's the, it was the knowledge when I was only 12 years old that even though I was a sinner and I wondered, could, could God love me to learn about Jesus and to realize absolutely he could, he does, and he not only declared it, but he demonstrated it. It changed my little life. And dear friend, that is the message that he has for us. And it's incumbent on those who have experienced the love of God to then go and express it by being willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And so often in church services like this, when everything is easy and fine, we say, I would, pastor, I would die for someone else. I would die for my wife or my husband. I would die for my child. I would die for my nation. And I'm not doubting that. That's awesome. But very few of us are ever going to be called to die, physically die, as a demonstration of our love. But often we say, well, I, I love like that. And John says, well, let's just get a little more practical. And so he, he says in verse 17, here's what, here's what love looks like. If anyone has material possessions, uh-oh, <laughs> I mean, do you have any material possessions? Well, some of you, I know you at least have a few because you're wearing them this morning. Thank you, by the way, for wearing <laughs> clothes. And we have houses, we have cars, we have food, we have jewelry, we may have money in the bank. We, we, have, we have material possessions. So this covers us all. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need... And when it says sees, the word in the Greek doesn't mean just kind of glances. This, this word means to intently gaze upon. So, so I've investigated this situation. I, I've looked into the facts. And this is a legitimate need that I see in my brother or sister's life. And so the first criteria is I've got the ability to meet needs. I actually see a real legitimate need that I could help. And here's how I respond. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them. Maybe your English version says, and closes his heart to that person. How can the love of God be in that person? 
John says, your claim that the love of God dwells in you is suspect. If you actually had the ability to meet a need, you see the need. And not only do you not meet it, you actually don't care. You close up your heart. Now, our English versions like to clean the Greek up here. We, 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 we think for proper society, we need to be careful in how we translate the Greek into our English. The King James Version gets a little closer to the Greek, whereas the New International Version I'm reading from today says, but has no pity. The King James Version puts it this way, 1 John 3, 17, but whoso hath this world good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his, here it is, bowels of compassion, From him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In the first century, especially in Greek thought, the seat of emotions is not here like we Westerners often describe love. You know, I love you with all my heart. For them, the seat of emotions was deeper down, it was in the gut, the viscera, yes, the bowels. That's very visceral. You you know you're moved with compassion when you feel it deep down. It's a gut punch. Whenever you see somebody that you love hurting, that's what love feels like. It's deeper down. And John is saying, if you have material possessions and you see a legitimate need in a brother or sister's life that you are able to meet, and rather than meet that need, you get... Financial constipation, you you close up (laughs) your love. You may be full of something, but it's not love, is what I think maybe John is saying. That if you can't if you can look at a need and you've got the ability to meet a need, but you don't care. How can you say the love of God dwells in you? Now, now we could have all kinds of debates and arguments about, well, when is helping someone actually hurting someone? Maybe I'm just enabling that person. Maybe they need to feel the consequences of their choices. Listen, we can have that conversation all day long. But what John is saying is you've got the ability to meet a need. This is a legitimate need that this person has. They're your brother, your sister in the Lord. And you choose not only to not help because... That's one thing. But you don't even care that they're hurting. You could care less what they're going through. It just doesn't even register on your radar of love what they're going through. How can you then say that the love of God dwells in you? You say, well, I love them. Well, love is better done than said. Love can't just be declared, it needs to be demonstrated. And one of the ways we demonstrate love is we help people in need if we have the ability to do it. Remember, that was one of the parables that Jesus taught. It was the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the question that prompted the parable was Jesus had said, you know, you're to love your neighbor. And then the religious people wanted to know the fine print. We're always looking for a way out of what God commands us to do. Well, what does that really mean? Who really is my neighbor? I love people, but I don't love them. I don't love him. I don't love her. But I love these people. These are my neighbors. Those people aren't my neighbors. So Jesus gave a parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. A Jew had fallen under the hands of robbers and had been robbed and beaten nearly half to death, left in a ditch to die. And one of his fellow Jews, a priest of all people that you would expect to help, sees the need, but goes on the other side of the street and keeps walking. A Levite, kind of like the associate pastor of the church, sees the same guy in the ditch, sees the same need, has the ability to help, and chooses not to get involved. Walks on the other side of the street, keeps going. But then Jesus gives the twist in his parable. But a Samaritan... A Samaritan. Now that doesn't mean anything to us today. But in first century, Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Samaritans were considered half-breeds by the Jews because their ancestors had been Jews, but they had intermarried with pagans. And they had a competing temple and competing worship with the Jewish people. The Jewish people considered Samaritans lower than a dog. 
Hanging out with Samaritans would defile you. You don't, you don't mess with those kind of people. You avoid those kind of people. And so you expect in the parable of Jesus to say, and the Samaritans spit on the guy in the ditch, the Jew in the ditch, and kept walking. But instead, the Samaritan goes and helps. Bandages up this Jew's wounds, cleans his wounds, pours oil and wine, puts him on his own donkey, carries him into a town, puts him in a hotel, pays for room and board, and says to the owner, if you incur any other expenses before I get back, I'll pay those as well. And Jesus said, basically, your neighbor is anyone whose need you see, whose need you can help meet. Doesn't matter their religion. Doesn't matter their skin color. Doesn't matter who they're going to vote for in this next election. You love people indiscriminately because Jesus loved you and died for you on the cross while you were still a sinner. So Jesus says, who do you think was the neighbor? You're wanting to know who is my neighbor. Who do you think was acting like a neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan? And and the Pharisee said, well, him who showed compassion. Exactly. Stop trying to figure out who is your neighbor and go be a neighbor. And love people like Jesus loves you. And that's one of the reasons we do this Be Rich campaign is because we don't want to be a church that says we love God. We don't want to be Christians who say we love God and that every good thing we have in this world came from God because it has. And we have material possessions. And we don't want to be a church that sees legitimate needs, but we don't care We want to be a church that says, God, you have so loved us. We want to love others. And we want to leverage our lives for the good of other people and help them when they're down and out, to help them when they're in need. One of the things we're going to do today is ask you to give over and above what you've already given, if you haven't done this yet, to a local nonprofit called Her Song. If you're new to our church, Her Song is a local nonprofit that rescues women from human trafficking. We have partnered with Her Song for the last two years. And today we're going to ask you give today. You can go to our website and give, fcbc.life. You can give today and use this envelope, whatever you put in there, cash or check in that envelope, and you can drop it off at those boxes on the side walls. Everything that's in this envelope is going to go to Her Song, every single penny. You can even go back and give this morning at the end of this service with your credit card or your debit card. We've got uh, Miss Tammy Jones. I think that's her back there with an iPad and a square reader. She's ready. If you'd like to just give this morning. So there's there's a need of people right here in Jacksonville. Watch this video and learn more about her song. Just take a couple of minutes and watch this. Hello, friends at Fort Caroline Baptist Church. It's so great to be with you today. I'm Rachel White. I'm the founder and president of Her Song, and I just want to share with you a little bit about um, our organization and give you an update and um, share with you the impact that your giving and your prayers and your support has had in the last couple of years. Her Song was founded in 2013 um, to address the need for safe housing and programming that could help survivors, in particular, of sex trafficking move forward in their lives, to empower them, um, to help them discover their identity and their worth, and to build a meaningful, purposeful life. And so that's the work that we've been doing in the community. And I'm excited to share with you that in the two years that you all have been supporting us, that we have housed 21 women in our program, helping them define who they are, heal their hearts and minds and bodies, get an education, begin a career and move towards a self-sustaining life. And we're seeing such beautiful things happen in our program and we couldn't do it without your support. We also answered 328 calls to her song in, in 2019 alone. Um, for survivors who needed help in taking next steps to get safe, to find housing that was supportive and could provide the services that they needed. So I just want to say thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for 
getting in the trenches with us and, and praying for us and helping us do this critical work in our community. We do have a big announcement. Some of you may know this already, but we have partnered with the Tim Tebow Foundation in efforts to expand our residential programming, not just here in the Jacksonville and Florida area, but also across the nation and across the world. So we need your prayers and support more than ever so that we can bring life-saving care to those that need us. So please continue to pray for us and thank you so much for being righteous people. The scriptures are clear that righteous people take action and you guys have not just listened, but you have acted on what you've heard and responded to God's tug at your heart. And so we are grateful to be on the receiving end of your faithfulness and your obedience. And we just want to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you and may the Lord continue to bless you. Amen. When I hey, go ahead, you've got a hand for what he's doing through her song. When I first met Rachel and learned more about her song, and, and more than that, whenever I met some of the women that have been rescued and helped uh, through this local nonprofit, I knew then I could not walk away from that introduction and do nothing. And I'm so proud of you as a church. In the last two years, you have given $66,000 to partner with her song. And so I want to thank the Lord for you. And this year, we have set a goal. We want to give them $15,000 this year. And, and maybe you're thinking, well, she just said they partnered with the Tim Tebow Foundation. You know, we, they don't need us anymore. Don't you realize that human sex trafficking around the world is a multi-billion dollar industry. It is more money than Google and Facebook earn combined. We need to help women right here in this city. And that's the other thing I love about this Be Rich campaign is while we do send hundreds of thousands of dollars around the world to mission work and mission efforts, we want to be a church known for loving this community in practical ways and helping people right here in our own city. And her song is doing that. Our philosophy as a church is rather than pioneer a, a, a ministry or a program, we would rather partner with people in our community who are already doing it, whether they're Christian nonprofits or secular nonprofits. We don't care as long as they're doing good work to meet real needs of people. And so we're going to ask you today, would you go to our website? Would you use that envelope and write a check or give cash? Would you go back and use the square reader uh, today? And let's reach this goal of $15,000 that we can present to her song. And if you're watching this online, no matter when or where you're watching it, get involved in this and be a part of how God is going to use this church to impact this community by partnering with her song. You saw in your seats today uh, what we're going to be doing for the rest of this month. For example, next week we're asking you to bring uh, toys for boys and girls that are at our Florida Baptist Children's Home here in Jacksonville. You can learn more about that at our website, fcbc.life forward slash be rich. On the 15th of November, we're going to ask you to donate food to fill up our food pantry called Arlington Community Services to help feed hungry people here in our community. And on the 22nd, we're going to tell you more ways about how you and your family or your life group can get involved in volunteering at local nonprofits who are asking us, could you help us? Could you send people to help us as volunteers during this time of the year? And so we're going to give you opportunities. Watch our, face, our um, Facebook our Instagram, but more importantly, our website, fcbc.life forward slash be rich to keep up with what we're going to be putting out for you to take your next step. There's another verse I didn't read to you. It's when John said in verse 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. He says, love is better done than said. Let's just don't use words talking about love. Let's just don't sing about love. Let's don't just preach about love. Let's don't just do Bible studies on the word love. No, let's love with actions. Let's don't just declare it. Let's demonstrate it. And not only do we love with actions, we love in truth. 
This is not because it's a program. It's not because the church made me feel guilty. It's not so I can get a tax write-off. It's not so that I'll look better in the eyes of someone else. It is just simply because the truth of the love of God has changed me. And I sincerely want to now share the love of God by meeting someone else's need. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the stillness of this moment, I thank you for this reminder through the Apostle John that love is better done than said. We need to say it. We need to declare it. But God, we more often need to demonstrate it and show it. And you've given us simple ways right now to demonstrate love by partnering with this one local nonprofit called Her Song through a financial offering. God, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you for stirring our hearts of compassion. Thank you for enabling us to be a part of giving because we know everything we have comes from you. And I pray that today, rather than close up our hearts, that we will open our hearts and that we will give generously and sacrificially because you first loved us and gave for us. Thank you for that, God. And God, if there's anyone today that needs this reminder, I pray they'll hear it, God, that we're never saved from the penalty of our sin because of the good things we do. We can't earn it. We can't work our way into heaven. We can't give enough money. We are only forgiven of our sin, made right with God when we place our faith in his son, Jesus, who stretched out his arms and loved us this much that he was willing to die for us as our substitute. And having risen from the dead, he hears us when we say, Dear God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. I confess my need for Jesus. I put my confidence in him and him alone. And thank you for the promise of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, if there's someone here today that needs to trust Jesus, may they take that next step and then may they let someone know, today I've committed my life to Jesus. In fact, God, maybe they'll tell us on the website or on Facebook today in the comment section. And they'll just say, today I committed my life to Jesus. We'll rejoice in what you're doing in all of our lives through the love of God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Now go and give. God bless you.